Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Peter Goddard, Director of the Institute for Advanced Study. And it's my pleasure to welcome you here this afternoon to the Institute lecture. Today our speaker is Arvi Vigdeson. Arvi is one of the world's leading theoretical computer scientists. His research centers on questions of computational complexity. Arvi obtained his bachelor's degree from the Technion in Israel and his master's degrees and in 1983 his PhD in computer science from the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at Princeton University. After visiting positions in Berkeley and at IBM, he joined the faculty of the Hebrew University in Jerusalem in 1986, becoming professor there in 1991. In 1997, he joined the faculty of the School of Mathematics here at the Institute as Herbert H. Maas Professor. Arvi's achievements have been recognized by very many awards and honors, including recently the Gibbs Lectureship and Conant Prize of the American Mathematical Society, and in 1994, the Nevin Lena Prize, which is awarded every four years at the International Congress of Mathematicians, alongside the Fields Medals. This evening, Arvi's title is The P versus MP Problem, Efficient Computation, Internet Security, and the Limits of Human Knowledge. Hi, uh, thanks all for coming. Uh, I have to, to explain this uh, uh, title to you, and uh, this is uh, just because it's an election time and I had to uh, <laughs> promise you things that maybe I cannot deliver, but I'll try. <laughs> so what is the P versus NP question? That's what we are going to talk about today, where it's a mathematical problem. It's a mathematical problem, you'd know it because if you go to the website of the Clay Mathematical, uh, uh, Clay Math Institute, uh, you'll see this list of problems. Uh, and for this solution of each of these uh, problems, they offer one million dollars. Uh, what they did, the, the um, uh, group of famous mathematicians that were called on to select this uh, list of problems was to, in some sense, imitate what uh, uh, was done in, uh, by Hilbert in 1900 at the break of the previous uh, century where he proposed a list of 23 problems that would occupy mathematicians for the 20th century. And it was a huge success. And so they selected seven problems for the 21st uh, century. And this is a list of problems. Uh, I don't know of a single person working on them that is uh, doing it for the money, but still you would uh, get this reward. And if you plan to, you should start working because one is already taken. <laughs> uh, but you see that our problem, P versus NP, is, is out there. Now, Peter told you I'm a computer scientist. This problem is a problem about computation. So we have to understand why uh, mathematicians put it there. Uh, well, it's certainly a mathematical problem. It's formulated precisely and it can be proven or disproved like any of these other very famous uh, mathematical conjectures. And what I try to explain is that it's actually more than that and it has an intellectual content that, uh, that goes way beyond the standard uh, things you see in mathematical problems. In fact, let me uh, draw a picture that will uh, sort of clarify it for you if you fall asleep for the rest of the talk. Actually, I always envy the physicists for having this image when they start talking about their problems about the universe until uh, a colleague told me that there was no copyright on this and we can use it too. <laughs> and <laughs> so this is our world. And in this world, the stars are computational problems. And we are trying to classify them, to understand them. And a snapshot of what we'll get to at the end is that NP is a class of, you know, these problems that we really want to solve or understand. And within it, there is a subclass, maybe a subclass, of problems that we can solve or can understand. And what we want to know is whether it's the same, whether we can solve everything we are trying to solve, we want to solve. 
Now you'll see in the beginning of the lecture that computational problems are present actually in every intellectual problem, scientific, mathematical, natural problems. And so asking whether P equals NP really addresses to some extent question about how much can we know? Okay, so let's start explaining this picture. The plan of the talk is pretty dense, but I have 15 minutes. Uh, is telling you about how we view computation, how broad is this phenomena for us. Then I'll talk about algorithms, which is the language by which we describe and understand computation. And then I'll talk about efficient algorithms uh, and define the class P. I'll talk about efficient verification and the class NP, so I'll define them both for you and we'll ask this question there more precisely, what is the, you know, whether P is equal to NP or not. And then I'll talk about this remarkable notion of NP completeness, this universality property. And uh, we'll see the sort of, we'll understand better the, bo both the question itself and the sort of, uh, what should we believe about the resolution of this question. And then we'll sum up. So first I want to talk about computation. I want anybody here that thinks that computation is about computers to forget it. It's far, far broader than this and computation is present in almost every, uh, everything we look at outside in the world. And if we had to define it uh, in these broad terms, you want to think of computation as any process whatsoever in which some slow, simple moves transform as one situation into another. And this can be some process that we want to perform or some process that happens out there. So I'll just go through a list of natural phenomena and you know, various intellectual challenges for which you know, computation is an essential component. Uh, so it's basically everything where there is a before and after, a before is converted to something sometimes later. And one that you definitely recognize as computation is this thing you learn in first grade where you know, learn how to add two numbers. It's a process that converts these two numbers into their sum here. And you know how it works for any such pair of numbers. And we would like to understand this process as much as we want to understand. <laughs> and in the same detail as we understand this process, for example maybe more unfortunate, but, uh, and we want to understand it like here. We want to know what happened to every possible input that we put, not just to this guy, but maybe also to this guy. We want to. <laughs> there are the, you know, almost a anything in nature you look at, you see this kind of processes happening. There's the evolution uh, from one time to a later time of weather, of uh, uh, biological, uh, processes, <coughs> and in fact there are two uh, forms of computations happening there. One is uh, what nature does when nature itself computes the, you know, output of each one of these, you know, what, what happens uh, two months or two hours later to any one of these uh, situations. And the other is the, the computation we would like to know, uh, to perform if we have a good model or good theory about these natural processes, we would like to predict what happens. Anyway, computation is present here. Computation, you know, these processes can be started in many different scales. So computation, what is the basic step or what is the basic uh, element in the computation differs even with respect to the same uh, phenomena you look at. For example, in the South, everyone remembers this uh, uh, epidemic in uh, 2003. You can, you can study it in the scale of how it spreads between human beings across the globe, or you can study how it, you know, the virus infects the cell. But one basic question about this kind of uh, evolutions is uh, if I even, if I told you precisely, if you understood this disease completely, uh, we could ask the question, will it, you know, uh, kill us all or will it be contained? And this is a kind of, question we want to answer about computation. We'll talk about it later. Computations are present in mathematics, just two examples you are familiar with. One is the solution of equations that we learn procedures for in, in school. And another 
that is you know, happening here all the time in the university and other universities. Mathematicians are looking at some statements and looking to find proofs. For example, in this case, that there are no solutions to such equation. So they are proving theorems. There are many other examples in mathematics. Of course, you know, everything we do, whether we think about it consciously or not, is uh, you know, a computation that, in fact, we'd like very much to understand, and they, they are sometimes extremely mysterious to us, like face recognition, or even more mysterious is the way we, we you know, emotions are generated in us by you know, looking at some, in this case, some set piece of news. And computations, well, I think you get my point. I could run through lots of uh, more examples. So computations are really everywhere. So how do we, how do we discuss them? How do we uh, talk about them? How do we formalize them? And here I uh, want to introduce you to you, those who never met uh, Alan Turing, uh, one of the greatest scientists uh, ever lived. Uh, he had a very short life with very tragic end, but that's, that's uh, not a story for today. What I want to tell you about today is his paper, this paper from 1936 when he was a PhD student on computable numbers with applications to the Enchindus problem, in which he basically answered this question, how do we talk about computation? He, in this paper, defined formally the notion of an algorithm. Today we call it a Turing machine in his honor. And it's really amazing what this single paper did. I mean, for one, it really is responsible for the computer revolution. That's really a subject for another lecture, but the notion of software and hardware and you know, universal you know, laptops is there already in this paper. And it's what enabled uh, computer revolution that you know of today. It contains uh, what followed from it was the Charles Turing thesis, which, you know, he defined, you'll see in a second, algorithm in the most primitive way. He defined it in the most restrictive way, but he nevertheless realized already there, already then, uh, that everything that nature can compute, you know, his Turing machine, his primitive Turing machine can compute. It's a thesis, he claimed it with, tu with the church, and it was not disputed in the, well, 70 years or so that passed. And the one piece I want to talk about here is that he already knew, even before computers existed, he showed that the very ability to formally define algorithms give you a way to limit their capabilities. So, let me talk about the definition. I mean, the definition was inspired by the way humans compute. He said that a, an algorithm is a step-by-step -step procedure, mechanical procedure that does local operations, like what you know from addition, and it works for every input. So you have one algorithm, I wrote it informally here, but you can specify it formally, like a computer program, which is what it was, that will perform this type of computation for every pair of numbers in this case when you are doing addition. So every step here is just, you know, you go from one cell to a neighboring cell, very local operations, remembering very uh, small amounts of information as you pass. You go every column three down, three up, continue, and so on. So that's an algorithm, and it has to provide an answer in finite time for every input. That's uh, when you have it, you've solved the problem. In this case, you've solved the addition problem. And once you have this mathematical definition, you can look at this sky of uh, computational problems and ask, well, may maybe we can solve them all in principle. And he already answered in the same paper, no, we can't. And using ideas of, ideas of Gödel, he showed the first such example, and it's pretty impressive if you are a computer programmer. What he's saying is that no algorithm exists to, take, to tell you if a computer program is faulty, if it runs forever, for example, which is a nightmare of programmers. This kind of problem can never be understood. And it took 30 some years more of work, but Matiasevich showed that another basic problem cannot be solved by algorithms. 
to the problem of whether equations in general have a solution in integers. So another basic problem is mathematicians look at. Another basic problem is biologists look at, we just talked about epidemics, is if I give you the, the rule, the exact way uh, some epidemic or population evolved, you want to know whether it will spread forever or not. No algorithm can do it in general. So there are all these things which, which, which we will never understand completely. We may understand special cases, but never completely. So that's on the left. On the right, there are all these problems we can solve. And in fact, people started developing algorithms that solve really important problems. But very quickly, uh, it became clear that Turing's uh, criteria was not tight enough. He said, the algorithm has to provide the answer in finite time. And if you come back from school when you are a kid and you ask your mom when will lunch be ready, you <laughs> she tells you in finite time. Uh, you know, we, we need answers quickly. We need answers in our lifetime to the questions we are asking, right? So when you start asking about time and other resources, you are asking questions of computational complexity field, which is the field I'm working on. So we want to understand for computational problems how long and how many resources do we have to invest in order to solve them. And in fact, this notion of the efficiency of an algorithm is somewhat subtle because the algorithm takes a variety of inputs, of maybe short and long inputs, and what we are trying to understand when measuring the efficiency of an algorithm is how the time or the number of steps decays as the data grows and grows. So the more we expect to, to work harder for harder inputs, but we want to know how much harder do we work as data increases, which is especially important today where lots of fields deal with gigabytes and terabytes of information. So let's try to do this. So I want to, whenever I say a problem, I want you to think of a family of instances to these problems of different sizes. If I talk about solving Rubik's Cube, I really mean a solution, a method that will solve Rubik's Cube on every side. When I talk about solving Sudoku, and we will talk about it, I don't mean just a standard three by three one, but also the less standard four by four, and the even less standard, I'm sure you <laughs> haven't tried this, and you know, just a method that will work for all of them. And we try to evaluate the efficiency of these methods. So let's look again at the efficiency uh, for algorithms that we are familiar with. Additions, we talked about it. Here's the algorithm. I always will have the algorithms with black on white uh, background. And uh, this algorithm can solve problems of every, any side. It just goes column by column, and it invests, in this particular case, six steps per column. So if we are solving problem on five digits, it will be 30 steps. 10 will be 60 steps, etc. If we have n digits, the number of steps will be 6 times n. And this is a fantastically fast algorithm. It works almost as fast as it takes to read the input, right? It's essentially the fastest you can have. That's the best kind of algorithm. These are the ones we seek. They are the most efficient ones. Here's another problem, which is familiar maybe not from first grade, but from second grade, which is multiplying long integers. And now the story is a little different because, you know, you probably remember that if you have n digits in the input, you have to write n rows of numbers of length n. So it's about n squared. And if the, uh, you know, so n squared steps to solve uh, n digit problems, uh, this is not as fast as before, but it's pretty fast. And I think you know, and certainly, uh, well, believe me, you can multiply huge, huge numbers, much larger than this, in, in split of a second. Because this algorithm is still efficient, or even though not as efficient as before. And actually, whenever we have an algorithm, it's not fastest. We have to ask ourselves, is there a faster algorithm? And in this case, actually, there are, but they won't teach you in second grade. And we don't know whether it's, there is an algorithm as fast as, a, as addition. Let me talk about another problem which is a factoring problem. Here, so here's a multiplication of two numbers which gives you this result, but suppose I didn't give you the numbers, I just gave you the result. The factoring problem is to find, 
to fill in the blank field. What two numbers multiply to give this result? These are called factors. And here, well, here's one algorithm. One algorithm, well, we don't know, so let's try. Does two divide this number? Does three divide this number? Does four divide this number? And so on. And this algorithm works, so it's solvable in Turing sense. But how long does it take? Well, if you have n digits in your number, then the number of possible numbers of length n is 10 to the n, exponentially long. Well, you have to only go to the square root, so 10 to the n over 2 is the number of steps you'll have to invest in this algorithm, which is terrible. I mean, if you think that your number was moderately <laughs> large, 1,000 digits, this is true even if every one of the 7 billion people on, in the world was cooperating to solve this uh, problem. I think the uh, world may be more peaceful if <laughs> they did that. But, uh, but anyway, it's hopeless. This algorithm is terrible. There's no point using it. And you should ask yourself, is there a faster algorithm? And like before, there is something a little faster, but still exponentially slow. So we don't know an efficient algorithm for this problem. And so you've seen three problems, and uh, you've seen an example of what you know, computer scientists do on a daily basis. We are in the business of understanding for every interesting computational problem, what, whether it's hard or easy, whether it's solvable efficiently or not. And we've seen examples which are easy, and here we have a problem for which we really don't know. It seems hard, but we still don't know. Maybe someone will find a faster algorithm, and we'll talk about the implications of that. But the bread and butter of the field is either finding efficient algorithms, that's a way to prove that the problem is easy, or proving that no such algorithms exist that will show that it's hard. Well, it's very difficult to do the second. In fact, that's why we still didn't solve P versus NP. So let me tell you first about finding efficient algorithms, because I want to tell you about some problems maybe you don't know about. So, uh, this is the, you know, sort of the fun or the, uh, you know, the useful things that are coming out of uh, uh, theoretical computer science research, discovering efficient algorithms for a variety of problems. And I call them gems because often they are really like gems. They are just so beautiful and so uh, useful. Uh, so, you know, if I ask you about this list of people, who do you know on this list, I'm sure that almost everyone will will say, sure, I know the top, you know, they invented famous things like the light bulb or the radio or the printing press or the steam engine. And I'm not sure you'd know about the second row, so I'll tell you what they did. Uh, the kind of algorithms that they, that they invented. And maybe you'll remember that. <laughs> um, but this will also serve me towards defining the class P, just these examples will be examples in the, pro in the class P. So what did, did Dijkstra do? So that's a, again, you, you'll be familiar with some of these problems. When you want uh, directions to get from here to there, you go on Google Maps or on MapQuest or one of this software, and you put in a query. Well, what's happening? I mean, this, this, the map contains millions, maybe billions of, of cities and roads. How do you get the answer immediately? Well, you get it because of Dijkstra's algorithm, which fits on this little piece of page. It's ingenious. It certainly doesn't look for all possibilities. It's much cleverer than that. It's invented a paradigm called dynamic programming that's useful in lots of other algorithmic problems. What did Knuth and his colleagues do? Well, here's a, another very basic problem. It's pattern matching. Pattern matching is a problem that you are given a long text in this case biological, and a shorter pattern. And the question is to find where does the pattern occur in the text. So here, in, for example, it occurs in these three locations. So that's what the algorithm should find. And again, it's a very basic problem, and this gem, real gem, solves it much faster than you would, you know, than what your first attempt to solve this problem would be. Just trying to match each time and each time going over the whole pattern. 
And this, uh, you know, it, it's embedded everywhere. It's embedded in lots of software on your PC, spell checking, test processing. It, this kind of algorithm and lots of its derivatives were used, were crucial to the genome project, to deciphering the uh, uh, human genome and other genomes, and in general still used everywhere in molecular biology. It's useful in web search and more and more. Here's another gem. Uh, was found here in Princeton, 1965, but actually, as, as lots of other things, Gauss knew about it and wrote about it already then. This is uh, called the fast Fourier transform. I will not explain it exactly, but the input to this problem is a signal like an, uh, a sonogram, for example, a list of numbers, and you want to represent it uh, in trigonometric sums. Doesn't matter the definition, again, a very, very elegant and extremely efficient algorithm made all these applications possible. It's essentially every uh, signal processing device application has this kind of thing in it and wouldn't exist otherwise. Audio, video, tomography, MRI, and lots of other things you probably wouldn't think about that are embedded in just other algorithms. In fact, the much faster multiplication algorithm I told you about uses this in its core. Last example is the uh, error correction. You probably know this kind of problem from your high school physics where you, you do some experiment and you get some data points and the teacher asks you to pass a nice curve through them. But some of the points are noisy and it's not clear how to do that. And, you know, here's a curve and some point moved. So in other words, you, you need to deal with some nice structures that noise attacked and, uh, de you know, deformed to some extent, and you want to recover from this fault. And this, again, gem of an algorithm that does this efficiently was found in the 60s, and again, it's embedded in every, you know, there wouldn't, you wouldn't have CDs or DVDs or cell phones or satellite communication working without this kind of algorithm because noise is present in all uh, communication in all storage media, and recovering from it uses this kind of algorithm. So, these algorithms and many others that were, were found constitute the class P, even those that were not found. P is the class of problems that have, you know, for which we can find solutions quickly, efficiently. P stands here for polynomial time, which talks about the degradation of time relative to the growth of data. It was defined in the 60s, and uh, there are lots and lots of practical interesting problems there. In fact, everything that, that you see implemented in any, you know, uh, any of your computers or computational devices, they are solving problems in P. And here's the basic question, you know, can we solve all the things we, are, we will ever be interested in? Well, I think that the main thing about this question is how can you even formulate such a question? What do I mean by all practically interesting people? Can we, can we bound them somehow? You know, you and I may be interested in very different things and how can I limit your interests? So let me try to limit your interests. Uh, let's try to, to talk about what would be interesting problems that we, we can even hope to solve. So let's talk just about search problems, problems in which we are looking to find something. Okay, so we've seen some examples, this short, short uh, path between cities. Uh, you know, we need to search for the path or pattern matching, find the occurrences of a pattern. We talked about factoring finding the factors of a number. Uh, two we didn't discuss, which are also sales problems, is uh, theorem proving the basic problem of a mathematician, you know, there is a Riemann hypothesis, there is a million dollar on it, find a proof. Probably you want to find a short proof because you want to have time to write it down in your lifetime. And uh, it's a very deep problem, here's a very shallow problem maybe, find solutions for Sudoku puzzles, find a method to, to solve. Sudoku puzzles. Well, they all look like different problems that we have to work on separately. So let's try to understand, and in fact, they seem very different because those two I told you are easy and those all seem difficult. 
So what's common to all of them? We are trying to find a common denominator for problems, you know, all these interesting problems. And I claim that in all of them, in all of these examples, there's something common, which is if I gave you a solution, you know, maybe you can't find a solution, but if I provided it for you, it would be easy to check, verify that the solution is good. Let's see. Okay, so for factoring, well, these are easy. You can find solutions. Factoring, here's a number, but if I gave you these factors, you can check me. You multiply them. Multiplication is an efficient algorithm, so you can check me. What about theorem proving? That's even harder, but if someone uh, found this proof and wrote it in the standard mathematical form with lemmas and stuff, other mathematicians could take it and verify that this proof is uh, good. And that's, uh, you know, the common practice of mathematics. And similarly here with Sudoku puzzles, you know, if I, maybe this is ha hard for you. Maybe it's a five-star Sudoku. But if I gave you the solution, well, Sudoku rules are very simple. You just verify that, you know, rows and columns and squares don't contain multiplicity. So this is common to all of them. And in fact, this is exactly the key to defining NP. So the class of class NP is a class of problems that, that look like this. You know, you are asked to find something. Maybe it's uh, like a needle in a haystack and, you know, you just can't see it. You, know? you look everywhere, but you can't see it. <laughs> but if I show it to you, if I point to you, to the needle, you say, well, sure, yeah, that's it, okay? So it may be hard to find, but it's easy to verify. This class, again, contains all problems for which there is an efficient verification algorithm that the solution is good. So maybe it doesn't guarantee finding. It just says that if a solution is provided, we can check that it's good. It was defined by Cook and Levin in the early 70s and again, it's a topic, a really nice topic for another lecture. Uh, not long ago, a letter from uh, Kurt Gödel to John von Neumann was found in the archive that was written way before that, in which Gödel more or less proposes the definition and discusses the importance of the class NP and the P versus NP problem in his own language, of course, but. So it's really, it's really fascinating. However, uh, uh, John von Neumann was, uh, was uh, already in the hospital and, and uh, died soon after, and this discussion didn't continue as far as we know. Okay, so this is a class NP. Now, the problems in the class NP are solvable in Turing sense, right? Because, you know, suppose we are looking for an object of, of you know, size n, n digits, then we know we can verify solutions, and we can definitely try all possible patterns of length n and check each of them, and if one solution exists, we'll know it. The problem is it's exponential time. This brute force algorithm is not an efficient algorithm. We can't really use it. And the basic, you know, the p versus NP question asks whether, you know, there are things much better than brute force. Are there shortcuts? Do all NP problems, which are, uh, these practically interesting problems have efficient algorithms. So repeating myself, just because it's so important, P is a class of problems for which you can find solutions quickly. NP is a kind of uh, the set of problems for which solutions can be verified efficiently. Now, in real life, you know, like with the needle in the haystack, like with, you know, maybe hard Sudoku puzzle, certainly in mathematics with theorem, uh, finding solutions seems much, much harder than verifying after they were found. And that's one reason people conjecture that P is different than NP. And it's only, you know, uh, a basic problem in, in computer science because we are in the business of finding, you know, discovering the difficulty of solving problems. But I want to argue much more than this. I want to argue that this question is much broader. It's central for mathematics, science, technology, and, and beyond. So I want to convince you of that. 
So let me, for this, uh, you know, so I want to, to, to tell you how broad this class MP is. So for this, let me draw a cartoon of uh, what people in some respectable professions are doing on the, you know, when they come to work. Uh, mathematicians, they are solving search problems, almost always. Mathematicians come to work, they have their favorite mathematical statement and they are looking to find the proof. Scientists, you know, they have data on, on some natural phenomena and they want to find a theory that explains it. Engineers, you know, they are given constraints about, you know, of all sorts, price, you know, cost, size, weight, energy, and they are looking for a design that, uh, you know, fits, you know, that sends these constraints for whatever, bridge, medicine, phone, you name it. I want to, to say that all these problems are in NP. Why? Because in all these endeavors, somehow, implicit or explicit is the assumption that when we find a solution, we will recognize that we found it, right? I mean, otherwise, you won't even start thinking. If you wouldn't be somehow sh sure that you will know it when you found what you are looking for, you wouldn't even start. Okay, so in some sense, in all these problems, there is a guarantee of efficient verification of a good solution. And because of this, these are problems, you know, problems like this are the problems in, in the class NP. So what does it mean? They are in NP. If P was equal to NP, then every one of these problems would have an efficient algorithm. We wouldn't need the mathematicians, the engineers, the scientists. We would just run our little program and in a few seconds we'll get you know, what we were looking for. In some sense, if P was equal to NP, then all the creativity that we associate with this kind of profession and the solution of these problems could be completely automated. And that's probably another reason why people don't believe uh, that, that P equals NP but it would put lots of people out of a job if it So, okay, uh, how do we, so how do we deal with this? We don't know, you know, it's still a possibility. How do we deal with this? I want to explain at least one feature of this uh, question that was understood by these founding fathers, Cook and Levin, when they uh, uh, actually introduced the class NP. Although I don't think they or anybody else at the time realized the, the breadth of this phenomena. And this phenomena is NP completeness. So we discussed some, to explain it, let's, let's look at some problems we discussed. We discussed some problems that are seemingly hard, you know, solving Sudoku puzzles in general, proving theorems in general, factoring integers in general. We think they are hard. Uh, maybe they are hard. But they, you know, look like completely different problems and, you know, the mathematician should work uh, on, on the theorems and the layman in the plane should work on the, you know, Sudoku and, and so the number theories on factoring and so on. But actually it's not, the, some of the picture is not the right one. Let me tell you the right picture. These problems are intimately related, as unrelated as they seem. They are intimately related. And let me show you a relationship. So even though we don't know the difficulty of any one of them, we can prove the following. If you manage tomorrow to find a method to solve Sudoku problems, if this is easy, then you automatically found a way to prove any theorem. And on the side, you automatically found a way to factor integers efficiently. So what's, what's going on here? How is this possible? What's the connection? I'm not going to explain, but Sudoku, as innocent as it seems, is a very special problem. It's called NP-complete. It's universal. It's the hardest problem in the class NP. If you solved it, you solved automatically all the problems in NP, not just this. If you have a solver for it, you solve any problem in NP. All of these interesting problems that scientists and engineers are doing. Somehow Sudoku, maybe you, have, you will have more respect from, for Sudoku. 
after this lecture. <laughs> and in fact, that's a, a nice way now, given that, to formalize the P versus NP question. So P equals NP if and only if you find an efficient algorithm to solve Sudoku problem. That's one way you can remember it. So let me repeat. Uh, there are these NP-complete problems. You saw Sudoku was one. And there is, there are a subclass of the problems in NP, right? If they are equally hard, if one of them is easy, all of them are easy. If one of them is difficult, all of them are difficult. So they are connected intimately. Uh, and what do we know about the problems I mentioned? Well, Sudoku, I told you already, is NP-complete, is one of these special problems. Theorem proving turns out to be also one of these special problems. Uh, and I'm sure Gedel realized it. It can be read into his letter. And integer factoring, we don't know. We actually have reasons to believe it's not NP-complete, even if it's not NP. But how general or how wide is this phenomena of NP-completeness? How many such special problems are there? It's actually, it took a couple of decades to, to realize. Maybe within computer science it, it, it was faster. It was clear that we have many in computer science. But by now we know that there are thousands of them in every, uh, you know, every branch of science, in biology, mathematics, physics, economics, the social sciences, astronomy, whatever. And it's really strange. I mean, I don't know of another basic, you know, mathematical notion, you know, property that is so prevalent across, you know, all these intellectual branches. Well, NP-complete is, NP-completeness is. And to convince you of this, uh, I just Googled and found three examples, and I am not, I repeat, this is three of thousands of examples. What are these examples? They are just citations from various journals in various fields in which the title contains the words NP-completeness, NP-complete. Okay, here you have uh, something on protein threading, here you have something on Nash equilibrium in games, here about system design. In journals of all branches of science, all these scientists are writing papers showing, you know, uh, doing our jobs in some sense, saying that uh, some computational problem is NP-complete. Why are they doing it? Why do they even know this? Why do they even know this concept? Well, the reason is that as for us, NP-completeness stands for computational difficulty, right? We, we don't know that P is different than NP, but we suddenly know that if P is different than NP, then all these problems are hard. So for, for them, usually uh, what it means is problems they are interested in or natural phenomena they are studying have some kind of structural nastiness which is embedded in this computational difficulty. And it can serve at some, some situations to, uh, you know, guide you into, if you're a scientist, to guide you in building better models or better theories for whatever you are studying. Let me uh, talk about consequences uh, of people. You know, it's, it's more or less, I said it all, but sort of I'm beginning my summary. So if P equals NP, then it's sort of utopia because all these problems of all these, uh, you know, creative men uh, and women uh, can be automated. And maybe that's the reason we don't believe it. What if P is different than NP? That's the situation we are in, at least right now. And then it means that some of the problems we want to solve, we just will never solve. But there's another aspect of this news. I mean, usually when something is hard, it's bad news. Actually, uh, one of the amazing uh, products of, of computational complexity theory was that hard problems can be useful. And in fact, you all know that. Maybe you don't know it in this form, but you all know that. So let me tell you, cryptography, you know, internet security is based on the existence of some special hard problems. 
And in fact, the kind of e-commerce, online shopping, secure email, maybe soon digital elections, electronic cash, etc. They are currently resting on the assumption that this same factoring problem we talked about is hard. And I'm not sure if it calms you down or not, but if somebody tomorrow finds a fast algorithm for it, then <laughs> this disappears. In particular, if P turns out to equal NP, then we have no cryptography, so maybe it's not as utopic as you thought. No secrets. Okay, let me summarize. Uh, so I showed you that computation is, is everywhere and that algorithms are the language by which we discuss and study computation. Uh, you saw that one particular, we have these really funny acronyms to represent problems like P and NP. NP, by the way, stands for non-deterministic polynomial time, which is a strange way to, to say that verification is easy. Uh, but is a, so lots of the problems we study in, uh, in uh, computer science are actually, it's nice that you can tell it on, to a friend or to someone on the street because they have some uh, you know, philosophical meaning. This problem is, you know, is search harder than, you know, verification. And we have others like that, you know, with strange acronyms which ask, uh, ask about the power of randomness in algorithms or whether quantum mechanics can be used to enhance computation. And this is a property not only of the questions we ask, it's also a prop property of things we discover. I'm not going to explain the acronym, but uh, for example, this result says that if a Martian came down tomorrow claiming to have a you know, winning strategy in chess, we could check him or her or whatever <laughs> they have there. Uh, it's far from obvious because you know, we know that exploring all the possibilities in chess you know, is, is like exponential. And with, so there are much cleverer indirect ways of you know, certifying optimal strategies. Uh, this result says that, you know, even extremely long and complicated proofs can be verified by a snapshot by looking at, you know, a few bits of the proof. This result says that uh, you can prove theorems, you can convince others that you have a proof of a theorem without giving them the slightest hint of how the proof goes. And more and more, so uh, I'll just leave you with a picture of our playground and you are welcome to join. Thank you. <laughs> Questions, I guess. Yes. So uh, I, that's so right, yeah. So let me uh, correct. So the question was uh, about uh, uh, the class of, uh, the, the class I called theorem proving. Theorem proving is one problem. It has, is one problem. Theorem proving is one problem. An input to this problem is some mathematical statement and you are asked to provide the proof, okay? So it's one problem. If you have a method to solve this problem, namely for every mathematical statement, give a short proof if there is one. If you have a method for that, then you have a method for solving any other NP problem. So it's again what I tried to demonstrate with the, with the Rubik's Cube and so on, was it when, what, I, what I call a problem is a sequence of instances of the problem. In the case of theorem proving is all the you know, mathematical statements mathematicians may be interested in. Specific instances may be hard or easy. So we definitely learn in school, you know, uh, how to prove some things and uh, mathematicians every day prove theorems. This is true about, you know, uh, just, just as, as well as we solve some Sudoku instances. That doesn't mean we have a method for solving 
efficiently an arbitrary one. Okay, so that's really the difference. That specific instances as opposed to the whole, to have a single algorithm like for addition that, you know, would add any two numbers immediately. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Why isn't it known? Uh, first of all, probably because it's not true. So maybe you, you see in this uh, picture that uh, P, you know, the problems that are easier over there, the problems that are NP complete are uh, on the left there. They are both classes of problems in NP. And actually there is this dark matter <laughs> in the middle. <laughs> I love the, the physicists, uh, you know. Uh, we know of very few problems that are, at least in current knowledge, are neither in P nor, in, nor NP complete. Uh, we have very few examples. There should be lots and lots out there, more than five, six of the mass. We know they exist, but we don't know of natural ones. Integer factoring and maybe three or four other examples we have, uh, uh, we, we believe they are not NP-complete simply because if they were NP-complete, something strange would happen. The strange thing that would happen would be something like P equals NP, which we don't believe. It's not exactly that, but if they were NP-complete, they would be, it would be too good to be true in some sense. So I can't actually go into the proof of this, but uh, there are problems. If P is different than NP, then we know for sure there are lots of problems in the middle that are neither in P nor NP complete. Yeah. So to make sure to understand further, so you assume that any problem is approachable computationally, and then you can separate it as P and non NP, or is there uh, like could there be NP problems and not be NP problems? So certainly, I mean, so when when you say a problem, you can ask, you know, uh, is this picture beautiful? You know, no, this I can also, I mean yeah. As, as an example, <coughs> the finding the theorem for a between in a highly distributed. Yes, yes, I believe, yeah, I definitely believe that uh, the question of finding, a, it may not be the right way to go about it if you are a physicist, but it definitely can be formulated computationally because I claim that whatever physicists are doing, they are analyzing the knowledge that exists in physics, they are analyzing the data that comes from various experiments, and they are trying to find a model, and also the model is something that's in their minds is, is quite rigid. It, for example, when they eventually write a paper about it, this paper will contain characters in, in from a certain set and will be of a certain length, right? So this question can be formulated very easily as a problem in NP. And moreover, the verification process of the referees, if they are serious, can be formulated also. And that should be an efficient algorithm because otherwise, you know, you will never agree to referee a paper. It's so, that's, uh, yeah, that's uh, an important message. I, I want to stress it's true that it may not be the right way to go about it, you know, if you are thinking about, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, explaining the outcomes of the uh, uh, LHC, y you may not want to think about it as one in a lots and lots of problems and try to solve them all at once. And mathematicians thinking about the Riemann hypothesis are not trying to solve all the other problems by general procedure. They are trying to solve specific problems. The point is that if P equals NP, then there would be a method to solve all these problems. We don't believe it, but we don't, we, it's amazing, but we still cannot rule it out. Yeah. Uh, I vaguely remember that when you identify a problem as NP complete, you make a transformation that shows that it's equivalent to another problem that's already known to be NP complete. Right. But you can't do this with the polynomial and with the other ones, can you? With what? Can you do it with the polynomial? Yes. So, okay, so first of all, to the question, the question was, how do you prove that a, a problem is NP-complete? Well, basically, you provide a dictionary, right? So you 
say you know that one of them is NP-complete. complete say uh, you want <coughs> uh, you, you know that Sudoku is uh, NP complete uh, you want to prove that theorem proving is NP complete well you provide a dictionary that will take Sudoku puzzles into mathematical statements then you know you assume you can solve you know you have a, a way to, to prove theorems and then you translate it back to Sudoku actually I should have done it in the reverse it would be more impressive the fact that Sudoku is NP-complete means that every theorem you may want to prove can be translated into, uh, into a Sudoku puzzle. And if somebody solved that Sudoku puzzle, you know, it can give you back the proof of the Riemann hypothesis. But that's these translations, this what Cook and Levin di discovered, these are, yeah, uh, uh, you, that's how you deal with NP-complete problem. You ask the same question about the problems in P. For P it is trivial because the translation would simply say solve the problem, it's in P, right? And so the reduction, this translation is automatic. You reduce either to, to a trivial yes or a trivial no. So on the right side it is uh, it's very simple, on the left side it's, uh, yeah, it can be worse. Absolutely. So it's a very important problem that I, of course, it's on my slides, so you cannot sue me, but, uh, <laughs> but I maybe <laughs> didn't, didn't, <laughs> didn't <laughs> stress enough. Uh, when I talk about Turing's uh, achievements earlier, uh, and I mentioned Gödel too, but one thing that Turing proved in his, his paper was that uh, to tell whether a mathematical statement is true or not is algorithmically unsolvable at all, right? Problems in NP are solvable. But the way I defined theorem proving was find a short proof. I said 200 pages, but you are given a limit. So if you are given a limit on the length of a proof, there's suddenly a finite algorithm that would try all possibilities. That's right. More questions? You have <laughs> I think, uh, yeah, you stopped on time. Uh, Peter gave me the sign. Thank you very much. <laughs>